Lawrence, I know as a scientist you don't like a why question, but I'm going to give you one anyway. <laughs> okay. Why is it that the laws of physics, laws of nature, are both intelligible and discoverable? Because. <laughs> no, but, uh, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's the big question that the physicists have wrestled with. Uh, why, why is the universe explicable? Apparently because it is. I mean, uh, 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 Eugene Wigner actually wrote a whole a whole beautiful essay on why why does mathematics describe nature so well? It didn't have to, mm -hmm. but it does. Uh, it is the language of nature. I think at some level, it, the basis of of modern science, uh, people become scientists because they have a belief system. At the one place where belief enters into science, in my opinion, and and I don't, I'm not a big fan of using the word belief, is the belief that the universe is explicable. And the proof of the pudding is that it is. It is. And, and, um, and maybe at some level, at some time in physics, we'll have a metaphysics argument uh, or a meta argument for why it couldn't be any other way. Really, I mean, that's the key question. That's the key thing that drove Einstein. He, he put it a way that mentioned God. I don't like the way he said it, but he said, did God have any choice in in the creation of he the universe. He didn't use God the way most people would use it. Yeah, he meant it yeah, in a very different way. But, but the idea is, is there only one set of laws of nature that hold together? If you took one piece and changed it, could it be, would it, the whole edifice fall apart? Or could you have lots of consistent universes? We don't know the answer. But I, I have to say that's the question that really drives at a fundamental level most physicists. Because what you'd like to do, you'd like to believe there's only one. And there's only, and and your job is to find it. Well, but but it's not logically ne necessary that even if you had the one, that that would be intelligible and discoverable to a human being. It's not logically necessary. And by the way, it could it may even be that it isn't. I mean, we <laughs> we you know it, right. when we we've come a long way, and we've discovered an incredible amount about the universe. We should be very proud of of, of what we've done, but we don't know ultimately if. A, if there is a final theory, and B, if that theory uh, will be explicable. Even if we have the theory, we don't even know if we'll be able to, to understand it, to be able to make predictions. To make, it might be like the mathematical case of, uh, of uh, unprovable propositions or, uh, or, or Gödel's theorem that, 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 that at some level there, within any uh, philosophical or mathematical construct, there are things that are, be, that are true that are beyond proof. Nature may be that way. So we don't know. It, right now, we've been very, very successful. We're on a roll, and we figure we might as well get there. And we have some guiding principles. And, guide, and those, we use words like beauty and elegance and things like that. What, what, what do those mean to well, physicists you know, or mathematicians? You know, I'm a little worried. They mean different things to different people. They're, they're time varying. I think to some extent, beauty used to mean simplicity hmm. in physics. The simpler the explanation, the more beautiful. Now the word elegance has cropped up, up a lot, and, and I think th that's really worrisome. In fact, the, the physicist Wolfgang Pauli used to say, elegance is for tailors. <laughs> and I think that's a really good, uh, good uh, line, which, uh, which, which I like to use nowadays uh, when people claim that their ideas are elegant. I think to some extent we've been, uh, because of, of lack of experimental direction, on what the next forefront is in, in, in understanding the laws of nature, people have in, developed very complicated mathematical frameworks, which may appear to be elegant. But, and so there's a generation, I think, of young physicists who don't really know what a beautiful idea is. They just know what an elegant one is. A beautiful idea is one that explains nature and, and, and does it simply. And, and lately, to some, for some people, elegance is the same as complexity. Hmm. It's the opposite of beauty. So I think you're seeing... Well, people, I mean, people say elegance is, it may be complex, but it has to be complex. As Einstein said something like, you know, I want things to be simple, but not more simple than they, it really they, is. Than they have to be. <laughs> exactly. You don't want to make it too simple. But so, I mean, the world is a complicated place. But what's wonderful about physics is you can show the many complicated phenomena arise out of some underlying things which are which are simpler than the than the diversity of phenomena right, they predict right, to be right. if you had as many laws of physics as you have phenomena it wouldn't be it wouldn't be useful so but so it's a it's a key question i think most 
And it's really in the eye of the beholder. I think most physicists and most scientists do what interests them. And they inevitably find whatever they're working on to be beautiful. <laughs> and it's up to the rest of us to, t to prove them wrong, basically. <laughs> and so we have to realize, uh, and in different contexts in, in, in society, I, I've, I've argued this very importantly, the easiest people to fool are, is yourself. The, the easiest person to fool is yourself. Anything you do appears to have significance and beauty <laughs> and wonder. And I've written lots of beautiful, wonderful theories down that are wrong. And um, sometimes other people have to convince me that they're wrong. And that's the way it works. And so it's really what the arbiter of what's beautiful ultimately is nature. As we have the laws of physics, which are beautiful and that are real, can these change? There's been some talk recently that the fundamental laws of nature can change. Well, that's, of course, the, really the most one of the most fundamental questions, because the fact that the laws of nature appear now to be time invariant is, is really of profound importance. In fact, it's the origin of one of the most important laws of physics called the conservation of energy. It turns out you can define the quantity of energy. Why? You know, kids often ask, why is it so big deal? This is conserved. Why should I believe it? It turns out you can show mathematically that that derives from the, from the fact that the laws of physics are invariant over time. A oh, oh, uh, female mathematician, Emmy Nerther, proved it, and, 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 and she's not as heralded as she would be. She never got a position in Germany and the, and, 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 because she was a woman, and the famous mathematician David Hilbert said, what are we running, a university or a bathhouse? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but, but her theorem is beautiful. Well, is, are the laws of physics invariant over time? And the question is only answerable by measuring it. And there are certain bits of evidence that recently have suggested that maybe some of the fundamental constants are changing. In fact, by the way, one of the best arguments that was earlier given by Dirac for why gravity is so much weaker than all the other forces is the following. He said, the universe is old. There's a big number, the age of the universe. If the strength of gravity changes over time, at the beginning, they could have all been the same. And gravity could have slowly been getting weaker, and the universe is old, it's weaker now. This, the large number hypothesis, he called. So it's a good explanation. It doesn't seem to be true in the sense that we've been able to measure that gravity hasn't changed very much by more than a factor of two between the time the universe is one second old and today. It's part of the research I've done, for example. But we need to know if those laws can change over time. And they're now very good, well, very acceptable theories that suggests that at the very early times, at least, the fundamental constants did change and eventually settled down to the values they have. And so this is not a question of philosophy, it's a question for physics, and we'll know the answer when we measure it. Does that threaten the foundation of physics if the either the constants or the laws themselves can vary? No, I mean, it depends what you define, of course, what you define by physics will change, but I think no, because physics is based on understanding how the universe works. And if that's the way the universe works, that's the job of <laughs> physics. So I don't see anything threatening. I'm not threatened. In fact, you don't look it. You don't no, look exactly. It. <laughs> In fact, that's the best thing about being a scientist is nothing should be threatening. 